I'm glad the slides are up because I needed the first slide to get going. I want you to soak that in. <laughs> what you're looking at here is the result of the most recent elections in Canada and the United States. I'm sure we recognize the gentleman on the right, our president, uh, President Trump. You may not be so familiar with the gentleman on the left. He's the Prime Minister of Canada. His name is Justin Trudeau. He is the son of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who was Prime Minister of Canada many, many years ago. He's passed on now. Uh, we all know, uh, uh, we can't help but knowing uh, Mr. Trump's uh, positions on things. He kind of makes them clear. Uh, you, 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 don't, you might not be as familiar with the, Mr. Trudeau. Uh, if I were to put him on a political scale, he would be left of Bernie Sanders. Okay, left of Bernie Sanders. If you, for those of you who follow these things, you know. The point I want to make here is that no matter our political perspective, we should be grateful nevertheless that we still have the freedom to vote and voice an opinion about our government Unlike other places, try asserting your voting rights in Cuba for a change. Go to China, see how far you'll get for a you know, fair vote there. So you, know, you have to get things into perspective here. As Christians, however, we need to remember not only to participate in the government of this nation, but also remember that we belong to the government of another world. This government is referred to as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of, of God. Jesus explained the duality of our situation when he answered Pilate concerning his true identity as a king of this other nation or uh, of this other government that was read previously. I'll read it again just to kind of press this in because this is the theme of our sermon. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. And so my sermon this morning, I want to talk about the kingdom of God, the government that we actually belong to that is present in this world and will exist in the world to come when this world will no longer be. And so the first thing the Bible teaches concerning the kingdom that is not of this world is that this kingdom was the subject of prophecy. The governments of the United States and Canada have been around for uh, hundreds of years and they rule over vast nations with millions of citizens. However, no one in the distant past predicted accurately that these governments, that these nations would exist and when they would cease to be. The kingdom of God, on the other hand, was a subject of prophecy centuries before it was realized here on earth. And as previ previously mentioned, was spoken of in the book of Daniel in some, some 600 years before its, uh, its arrival. It's an amazing thing. We're familiar with the book of Daniel. Let me just summarize you know, what it said about the kingdom. Daniel and other young Jewish men of noble blood were carried off into Babylonian captivity where they were by the grace of God and their faithfulness to God in, in trying circumstances, they were raised to high levels in the court of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Soon after, Daniel was called upon to interpret a strange and disturbing dream that the king experienced and within his interpretation of this dream, God revealed the sweep of history that was to come, as well as historical markers for the arrival and the development of God's kingdom on earth. Daniel's inspired interpretation of this dream is recorded in Daniel chapter two, and its accuracy concerning future earthly kingdoms has been established as history has unfolded. So let me read a portion of that in Daniel 2. 
It says here, here Daniel is speaking to the king and interpreting the king's dream. He says, you, O king, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you and its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that, was struck, the, the, stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now we haven't read the whole passage here of Daniel, but I want to mention to you what a miraculous thing this prophecy was. First of all, Daniel described the dream that the king had without any help from the king, who kept the nature of his dream secret as a way of testing the legitimacy of the interpreter. So he had, he had said to his magicians and to his soothsayers, I want you to interpret my dream. And they said to him, okay, well give us the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. He said, no, 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 no. You're going to tell me what I dreamt and you will interpret it. None of them can do that until Daniel came along. And Daniel not only interpreted his dream, of course, but he also uh, explained the dream that the king had. Secondly, Daniel accurately describes the rise and fall of four world empires in correct succession over a period of six centuries into the future. 26 centuries if you count the kingdom of God and its continuation to this day. So let's examine his interpretation just a little more closely, shall we? Note that the statue here, you know, this image that has been drawn up based on the Bible description, note that the statue in the dream is made of many parts, a head of gold, a breast and arms of silver, a belly and thighs of bronze, legs and feet of a mixture of iron and clay. Now in the dream, a stone cut without human hands appears and strikes the statue not on the head, but on its feet of iron and clay, reducing the entire statue to dust, which is blown away, and in its place the stone becomes a mountain that fills the entire earth. So let's continue reading in Daniel. Daniel says, this was the dream, now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over all of them. You are the head of gold. After you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you than another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another properly, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushes the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. And so in his interpretation, Daniel names five separate kingdoms. First of all, he describes the Babylonian empire, the head of gold. 
This was a fitting symbol because Babylon was the finest of the ancient kingdoms lasting over a hundred years, 625 to 539 BC. The second kingdom he describes was the Medo-Persian Empire, the breast of silver with the two arms. Daniel mentions two arms which describes the dual nature of this empire ruled uh, by a combination of the Medes and the Persians. They were noted for their great wealth, seen in the abundance of silver coinage during their period, 539 to 331 BC. The third kingdom that he names is the Greek empire, the belly and the hips of brass. Alexander the Great defeated the last of the Medo-Persian kings, Darius III, in 330 BC. The Greeks innovated the arms of war by using brass armor as protection. Greece was then defeated and absorbed by Rome in 146 BC, their kingdom lasting from, 33, uh, from 330 to, uh, BC to 146 BC. The fourth empire, the Roman Empire, the one he describes, the legs of iron with the feet of clay mixed with iron. Iron because the Romans, the Romans innovated the use of this metal in warfare. As it grew, Rome would make alliances with foreign kings which ultimately weakened its empire and was a factor in uh, its demise in 476 AD when Romulus, the last of the Roman emperors, uh, emperors was uh, overthrown by the German leader Odoacer who became the first barbarian to rule in Rome. The mixture, the idea of the mixture of iron and clay was the mixture. Normally Rome would simply conquer a people and take over, but with time, they, you know, as their empire expanded, they didn't conquer the people, they simply made alliances with them. That explains you know, the clay and the iron, and those exterior alliances were the weaknesses of the Roman Empire, which ultimately led to its downfall. Note carefully that all these kingdoms succeeded each other in history, and Daniel correctly described their appearance and their demise in proper order, doing so in the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Nowadays, and I mean, I, I, I take nothing away from people who work, you know, meteorologists to try to figure out the weather, very important, but you know how difficult it is simply to predict the weather in three days. Could you imagine predicting four different kingdoms over a period of 600 years and nailing it exactly one after another? Uh, nothing short of divine power to do that. Then, the four kingdoms, then there's the kingdom of God that he talks about, the stone that grows into a mountain. Note carefully what Daniel says about the fifth kingdom appearing as a stone that grows into a mountain. First, it's time of appearance. It appeared during the fourth kingdom, which was what? Rome, the place of its appearance. It says that the stone struck the feet of the statue, the feet of the statue, not the head, which in the context of the Roman Empire would have been the city of Rome itself, which was the continual target of all of its enemies. Yet in his dream and in his interpretation, he says the stone doesn't hit the head to destroy it, it hits the feet, represented the outlying provinces, provinces like Judea, where Jesus ministered and established the church. Then he talks about the type of kingdom. The stone cut without hands is a way of denoting that this would be a supernatural kingdom, not a temporal kingdom like those before it. And note that unlike these other kingdoms, Daniel states that this fifth kingdom will be established by God. Daniel chapter two, verse 44. And then he talks about the duration of this kingdom. The other kingdoms had periods of glory and power lasting centuries, but Daniel says that the fifth kingdom will be everlasting, never to fall. The image of the stone growing into a mountain, filling the earth, symbolizes a kingdom that will dominate every other kingdom in history. Therefore, some 600 years before Christ, a Jewish prophet spoke of four kingdoms that would rise and fall until a fifth kingdom would be established that would dominate the world and last forever. For six centuries, so by the way, if you're wondering, that's just the preamble. I'm getting into my lesson here. <laughs> 
Just in case you didn't cover this other material in Bible school, I just wanted to make sure, okay. So therefore, some 600 years before Christ, a Jewish prophet spoke of four kingdoms that would rise and fall until a fifth one would be established that would dominate the world and last forever. So for six centuries, the Jewish people waited for this kingdom prophesied by one of their own prophets, Daniel. And then one day, a prophet in the spirit of Elijah proclaimed, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3.3. 3. Can we understand then why John the Baptist's preaching caused so much excitement among the people? And so in speaking of the kingdom that is not of this world, we note first of all that this kingdom was spoken of in prophecy, which has since been confirmed by history. Another feature of the kingdom that we as Christians belong to is that this kingdom is on earth, but it is spiritual in nature. Daniel predicted that the kingdom was to come and John the Baptist preached that it was at hand and Jesus proclaimed that it was here. For Jews who had actually lived through the four empires mentioned by Daniel, this was exciting news. For some, it rekindled nationalistic aspirations that had appeared throughout their history. I mean, many had a, a, what we call a Davidic concept of the kingdom. In other words, their hope was that God would send a king like David who would lead them out of bondage and regain their lost territory. They believed that the day of the Lord was to be a time when the nation would be restored. Amos chapter nine, verse 14, and Zechariah the prophet, chapter eight, verses four to eight. They believed that the nation would be restored and other nations would be judged. Their hope was kindled and dashed repeatedly throughout post United Kingdom history. In other words, after the United Kingdom, you know, the, uh, this hope of a Messiah kept kept arising and falling as one leader after another appeared claiming that they were the Messiah. From Zerubbabel leading the first wave of exiles from Babylon back to Jerusalem to the Maccabean revolt, their hope was for a kingdom of this world peopled by Jews. Their kingdom was a dream of Jewish nationalism. During the intertestamentary period, that's between the period of the two testaments, 400 years, you know, 400 BC to 6 AD, we call that the intertestamentary period, another view of the kingdom began to develop among non-inspired writings of that time, writings that we call apocalyptic literature. And so the writings of this era hoped for a heavenly kingdom which would end the present evil age. In the book of Jubilee, for example, 23 verse 29, the author suggests a golden age to come in which God himself would usher in his kingdom, reversing the rule and the evil of Satan. So there were a lot of ideas of the kingdom that were swirling among the people for centuries before Jesus arrived. And so these and Various combinations of these ideas were swirling about in the minds of the people as John the Baptist spoke of the kingdom. So I think we can understand therefore that when the people heard Jesus teach that the kingdom had arrived and they witnessed his powerful miracles, they were ready to crown him king, whether he liked it or not. He fulfilled all of their aspirations. Imagine, how would you like for your president to be able to do miracles? How would you like for your president to go to a rally with 10,000 people and, and, and miraculously provide food for all 10,000 of them? I want to vote for that guy. This was the feeling at this time. But then Jesus started describing the kingdom in detail. And it didn't fit any of the notions that the writers and the peoples had. In addition to this, he described the kingdom in abstract terms uh, with the use of parables and without references to political power or military dominance or any kind of economic features. He said that the kingdom was like mustard seed or a man who sowed seed. He taught them that the kingdom was like leaven that leavens dough or a net that catches fish 
or a relationship between a master and a servant, or a person that finds a pearl or a, or a treasure. True to Daniel's words, Jesus begins to teach the people that the kingdom is supernatural in nature, not political. And the kingdom, Jesus says, is, as was read, my kingdom is not of this world. They were expecting a kingdom of this world. They didn't mean that the kingdom had no power or authority. It simply meant that as a spiritual kingdom, its power and authority were derived and controlled by God, not armies, not humans. And so the kingdom that Jesus and his apostles announced was one that was small enough to exist in one person's heart, was big enough to include all who would enter in, was powerful enough to dominate every other kingdom, and was so precious that when someone found it, they would abandon everything they owned in order to possess it. And yet, was so elusive that some people stood right next to it, but didn't even see it. Finally, the kingdom that Jesus spoke of was being built in their lifetimes, exactly as Daniel had spoken. So, the kingdom was the subject of prophecy. The kingdom was something that was spiritual. And the kingdom was something that has been established. Many years ago, I had a friend who worked in Saudi Arabia for several years. And when I would write to him, because we corresponded, uh, I would address his envelope at the end, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That was part of the address. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia included all the territory over which the King of Saudi Arabia ruled. And throughout history, this has you know, been different according to how much land the king obtained through war and so on and so forth. The point here is that the kingdom is that which belongs to the king. This is the earthly, physical understanding of the term kingdom. But let's read something in Matthew 6, shall we? Pray then in this way, Jesus says, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In this passage, Jesus mentions one kingdom in two spheres. One kingdom is on earth that had yet to be established. The other one was in heaven that was already established. Therefore, Jesus was praying that the will of God be done on earth as it was already being done in heaven. An important point to note here is that the kingdom of God exists wherever His will is being done. Because the word kingdom comes from a Greek word which means sovereignty or will. In Matthew 6, 9, 10, Jesus is praying that God's will be done here on earth and thus establish the kingdom here as God's will is now being done is in heaven. When this happens, God's will will be done and the kingdom will be established in both the heavenly and the earthly realms. And so if we want to know what the kingdom looks like, we need to examine what God's will is for all men because the kingdom exists wherever God's will is being done. So let's take a look at another passage, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul writes, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Wait a minute, what did he just say? <coughs> acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desire, who desires? God desires, what does God desire? What does He want? What is His will? Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, and what is the truth? For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. What is God's will? That all men come to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be saved through him. That is God's will. When that will is being accomplished, then the kingdom of God is being established. An important point to note here is that the kingdom of God exists wherever His will is being done and Paul summarizes His will in this brief passage. As Paul writes, 
God's will is that all mankind recognize the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and they will be saved as a result. Insofar as the kingdom is concerned, it is being established whenever and wherever people are confessing Jesus and expressing this faith in repentance and baptism, Acts 2.38. When they do that, the kingdom of God on earth is being established and the kingdom is growing. Now doesn't this knowledge unlock all of the parables about the kingdom? Isn't Jesus the pearl of great price? And are, not, and are we not willing to abandon everything in order to have him? Isn't the word of God the leaven that permeates the entire life of, of a man or a woman? Isn't preaching the gospel a great net that draws in many hearers that are eventually reduced to just a few believers? Isn't Jesus the master that leaves his disciples to care for the kingdom and will return one day to examine their stewardship? Isn't the knowledge of God's will small enough to exist in one believer's heart yet big enough to reach every soul in the world? Isn't God's will powerful enough to destroy every human kingdom while sustaining his own kingdom to the end of time and beyond? You know, we're, we're not premillennialists who are waiting for the kingdom to come. That's our neighbors across the, across the street. They're, they're waiting for the kingdom to come. Nor are we post-millennialists who think much like the Jews of the first century that the kingdom will be some kind of golden age where the church will dominate here on earth until Jesus returns and you know. We don't believe that. Our view is much simpler to understand and taken primarily from the previously quoted Matthew 10 verse 6 to 9 where Jesus prays that it's God's will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. When seen through the lens of the kingdom we understand that all who are in heaven are obviously under the authority and will of God and so the kingdom of God is firmly established there. And Jesus' prayer is that God's will, that man's salvation through Christ also be established here on earth. So when someone asks when or how was the God's kingdom established here on earth, your reply according to scripture should be the following. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ was established when the gospel began to be preached and people responded to it in faithful obedience. That's when the kingdom was established. That's when the doors were opened. That's when people started coming in. To be more specific, the kingdom was established when Christ defeated sin and death with his resurrection to accomplish the first part of God's will, and that was to provide redemption for man's sins through the sacrifice of his son. And the doors to the kingdom were flung open as the apostles were first to enter in and then on Pentecost Sunday they began to preach the gospel to invite everyone who believed to also enter into the kingdom of God. A familiar passage but an important one. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do to get into the kingdom? And Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise, what promise? The promise of the kingdom for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Another little bit here. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Added to what? Added to the kingdom, that's what? They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. As Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, but as we have learned, it is very much in this world. 
and embodied by those who have been added to it through faith in Jesus Christ through repentance and baptism. Okay, so so far we've seen how and when the kingdom was established. One other thing we need to examine, how the kingdom grows, because Jesus often spoke of its growth and development. So very briefly then, Jesus spoke about the kingdom in two ways. One, as it related to an individual. The kingdom of God within you, he said. He used the example of a seed or a leaven referring to agents that, would on the ins that worked on the inside of a person to cause growth. These agents were figures representing God's word given through the Holy Spirit and recorded by the apostles. The kingdom, that is the ability to do God's will and become like Christ, the kingdom grows within the individual as he internalizes and submits to the direction of God's word. How do I grow in Christ? I obey his word. The growth of the kingdom within becomes evident externally as the kingdom dweller produces spiritual fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, holiness, service, Galatians 5.22. Paul calls it fruit of the spirit, but we could just as easily call it fruit of the kingdom or the kingdom within the believer. So when you see these things developed in one's life in the name of Christ, you are seeing the kingdom that is not of this world living within the believer who is in this world. And then secondly, the kingdom in a collective sense. Jesus, the apostles, and other New Testament writers use different words when referring to the kingdom collectively. In other words, many people in whom the kingdom was present. They use terms like the church, the saints, the household of God. This collective kingdom grows in numbers and spiritual influence on the world as it spreads the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom. And so, this kingdom of God on earth is made up of individuals who have and continue to respond to God in Christ. Individually, they are called Christians, saints, disciples, believers, to name a few. Collectively, they're referred to as the church or the body of Christ, among other things. If, you'd obey, if you've obeyed God's will in believing and obeying Christ, the kingdom is in the form of the Holy Spirit and the word of God are in you as an individual. The kingdom is in you. And at the same time, you as an individual become part of the kingdom of God comprised of all those who have been saved both in heaven and on earth. And so the apostles had a, a hard time understanding the nature of the kingdom to the extent where they never even asked the obvious question. What is the purpose of the kingdom? Why was it formed? What's it all leading to? And so in this lesson, excuse me. In this lesson, I've been talking about the kingdom of heaven on earth, but I haven't really discussed the kingdom of heaven in heaven. An important point to remember in all of this is if we are the part of the kingdom here on earth, it means that we will also participate in the kingdom of heaven that is in heaven. Praise God for that. The kingdom here on earth is the kingdom. However, it is not yet glorified. It is not yet exalted as the kingdom. This is the end game of Christianity. The kingdom of heaven in heaven is already glorified. And those who are part of it have things that we don't have yet. Things that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15, where he describes the features of the glorified body. Well, the features of the glorified body is also the features of the glorified kingdom. For example, he says incorruptibility. In other words, as individuals, we'll have no sin, no weakness supernatural power, we will not be subject to time or natural laws. Eternal existence, meaning no death, and spiritual glory, in other words, spiritual gifts perfected to the point where they are a source of light that emanates from within us. And so the glorified state will enable us to become like Christ in power, as well as like Christ in personality and righteousness. This is the reward, don't we get it? God sent Christ to show us 
what was waiting for us. The end game is that I become exactly like Him. The end game is that you become exactly like Him. You know when they say keep your eye on the cross, keep your eye on Jesus, they're saying keep your eye on the one that you will eventually become like. And that will guide your steps. The glorified state is what we are going towards. The exalted position in the Godhead is our final destination. And so the return of Jesus at the end of the world will signal the joining together of the kingdom of God on earth with the kingdom of God in heaven and together with the angels and Jesus himself, all will be united within the Godhead to exist in this way for eternity. So let me summarize very, very quickly. The kingdom of God here on earth, Daniel predicted it. Jesus proclaimed and died for it. The apostles opened its doors with their preaching. People have entered in through faith expressed in obedience. And we all await the return of Jesus for its glorification and its final eternal exaltation. And so in the meantime, here's the take home. Okay, I've said a lot of words here, but here's the take home. In the meantime, I want to remind you of one thing and then this lesson is yours. I want to remind you that you, you are the kingdom in this world, not these guys. You are the kingdom. Let this be a comfort to you when personally you feel weak or dry or outnumbered. You are the kingdom. Remember, you are the kingdom in this place, in this world. Not these guys. Let this be a comfort to you in the church where it seems that we're not making progress or we're going backwards and forwards. We got Remember, you're the kingdom, not these people. You're the kingdom, not these guys. And because this is so, you may be reduced, discouraged, unsure, but you cannot be defeated because you are the kingdom in this world, not these guys. And so I pray that God blesses you as you build up the kingdom of Christ and you wait patiently for His return. And remember, you're the kingdom, we're the kingdom. Let that direct the way that we live and let that be the substance of our strength and our, and our hope. And so if you have not entered the kingdom, if it's possible that you're sitting here at the door of the kingdom and you have not yet entered in by confessing Christ, by being baptized, by repenting of your sins, where you have an opportunity to step in and if you've left the kingdom because of unfaithfulness or willful sin, whatever, and you need to be sure that your position in the kingdom is secure because of your faith and your obedience, well, we're ready to minister to you at this time. And so if you have any need, we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.